Everyone ready for a good lecture? I am. I'm excited about this. Welcome to a special edition of Skeptical Inquirer Presents uh, at CFI Western New York. Tonight we welcome Melanie Tresick King. There you go, got it right. Uh, <laughs> Melanie is the creator of Thinking is Power, an online resource that provides engaging and accessible critical thinking content. Tresick King is an associate professor of biology at Massasoit Community College. I was worried about getting that wrong. Uh, <laughs> where she teaches general education science course uh, designed to equip students with empowering critical thinking, information literacy, and science literacy skills. An active speaker and consultant, Teresa King, loves to share her teach skills, not facts approach with other science educators and to help schools and orga organizations meet their goals through better thinking. That's awesome. Uh, so the spread of misinform misinformation has reached an epidemic proportions. Uh, thankfully, science has found a solution, inoculation theory, which applies the logic of vaccines of misinformation. This presentation focuses on active technique-based inoculation in which students learn the techniques used to mislead by creating misinformation. I'm so excited about this. So please give a warm welcome to Melanie Trisick King. <laughs> Can you hear me? Ah, oh, I'm so excited to be here. So, when a cell starts to divide, in interphase, it replicates its DNA. And then in prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase, the chromosomes break apart and you get two new identical cells. Who here is bored? Yeah, honestly, so am I. And as a biologist, it kind of kills me to say that because that stuff is really interesting. And quite frankly, I do think everybody should know that. I teach a science uh, class at a community college um, that is, um, is for non-majors. So these are people who don't want to be scientists when they grow up. Um, and for years, I taught intro bio, which is the course most non-scientist majors take. And I was teaching them the kind of stuff that I just went through with you. And at one point, I mean, I really tried. But I looked out at my students, and, and they were bored. And I started to think, like, well, first, who here is going to remember what I just told you? Oh, one, thank you, overachiever. Um, but you could always look it up if you needed to, right? So I thought instead, um, I wanted to teach students how to be good consumers of information. Um, how to make better decisions, uh, to be empowered to um, live a better life. So um, this all started when, um, again, with my class, I got really frustrated with the process. And um, the course that I designed in its place um, teaches what I call skills, not facts. The most popular biology textbook for non-majors in the United States, and I'm not naming names, for a semester-long course for non-majors, is over 800 pages long. And the first chapter has about four pages with the process of science. And the rest of it is really interesting factoids, like the one I just told you. But the process, I mean, who can remember that much information? Um, they're never going to use it. Uh, and you know, quite frankly, it leaves students with the impression that science is a bunch of things to memorize. It's fact-based, right? It's certain. When science has proven something with facts, then I'll believe it, right? So we've all heard that, I'm sure. So instead of that, um, I thought, let's do skills instead. So I have what I call the trilogy of skills, critical thinking, information literacy, and science literacy. So critical thinking, um, lots of definitions. Um, the, my favorite simple one, the ability to draw reasonable conclusions from the available evidence. Information literacy. If I need information, can I find reliable information? And then can I use that to make a better decision? So then science literacy is, instead of here's the things that you need to memorize, how does science work? What is the process of science? So actually, um, one day one of my students, I was covering the stages of the uh, cellular respiration, in particular the Krebs cycle, and the Krebs cycle is this you know, really brilliant um, uh, series of uh, removal of electrons from carbon atoms to make um, ATP energy. 
one of my students raised their hand and said, well, how do scientists know that? Like, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm a plant ecologist by training, so I, that was my excuse. So at lunch, you know, some of the chemists were in the office, and I said, my students asked me this. And they looked at me like, you know, I don't know. And that really got me thinking. And quite frankly, to this day, if I teach the Krebs cycle, I have to review it. And I've been through it lots of times. So I really felt like I was failing students. And instead, I wanted to teach them how the process of science works. Actually, looking back, um, I designed the class and started teaching it before the pandemic. But during the pandemic, we saw science play out in real time. All right, we saw a new virus, a new vaccine. How does it transmit? What, it, what is its reproduction value? Um, what's its fatality rate? Do masks work? What kinds of masks? In what different settings? Does it matter what? how they wear the mask. I mean, of course all those things matter, but we didn't know, right? So we were learning. And to my students that I taught before the new way, I kind of feel like I failed them because I didn't teach them, like they saw the sausage being made and I feel like they were waiting for definitive answers. And science doesn't really do that. So the course uses, the goal of the course is to teach these skills, not facts. Now to do that, I employ three strategies. The first one is, um, I wonder if you ask students to think critically through a claim, actually if you ask anybody to think critically through a claim, then where do you start, right? So um, if I made the claim that, um, oh I don't wanna get ahead of myself because I've got a good example coming up, but um, I want students to be able to think about, um, think sequentially, like my brain is really linear and so I thought, if I gave students a place to start and a way to work through. So I, I developed the Flutter Toolkit, it's, it's in Skeptical Inquirer, um, and I introduce it early, and I practice with it a lot. And I practice with it using a lot of misinformation. So um, I'm a huge fan of including misinformation in a, a classroom. If we only give students good information, reliable information, then how can they tell the difference? So by showing them a range of different kinds of information and giving them the skills to think critically through it, hopefully they can make better decisions. And finally, the topic of the talk today is inoculation activities. Um, but I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, so. Are you familiar with this? Perineum sunning, uh, bot sunning, however you call it. Um, no, quite frankly, whether this is real or not, or if it was just sort of a fad that everybody laughed at, it doesn't matter. You all laughed. And there's a certain kind of, wait, does that make sense? Um, it's fun. It's engaging. Um, and I start purposefully with non-triggering misinformation. So um, in science, we teach uh, um, apparently more and more things that are um, controversial. Controversial. Um, Evolution, climate change, vaccines, right? If I go into a classroom where students are already ideologically opposed to any of those issues, I'm gonna trigger them and they're not gonna hear the lesson. So what I do instead is I start with stuff like this. Non-threatening, funny, right? So this way we get to practice using the Flutter Toolkit and thinking through um, claims and building the muscle so that when I get to something like climate change or evolution or GMOs, they're able to better um, recognize the process and hopefully um, realize where they may have been led astray by identity issues previously. And, right, humor always helps. <clears throat> we all know this, right? There is a lot of misinformation out there. There always was a lot of misinformation out there, but the internet made it even more um, available. <sighs> Social media, pandemic. Actually, the World Health Organization is calling the current spread of misinformation, um, it's reached epidemic proportions, so they're calling it an infodemic. And so we are inundated with information all the time. Is that good information? How do we know the difference? How can I use information to get to a more reliable conclusion? 
So this is what I wanted my students to be able to do. When faced with a claim, whether it's scrolling across their new feed, news feed or it's something they find in the drugstore aisles of a chain we shall not name, then I want them to be able to think about it. So this is my goal. Now, fortunately, science has a really interesting solution. And it's called inoculation theory. So I could cover every piece of misinformation out there today, if that was humanly possible. And tomorrow, new one's going to pop up. Right? I can't chase it forever. So what I can do instead is teach students different types of misinformation and how to think through it. Using um, uh, the psycho uh, psychology theory called uh, inoculation theory. So this was first developed by William McGuire in the early 60s. And the idea is like a vaccine. So you know how you can expose the body to bits of a germ, and then the body builds antibodies to it so that when it's exposed to it in the real world, it can fight it off. Right? It remembers that virus. Inoculation theory does something similar, but for misinformation. So what it does is it exposes the brain to a bit of misinformation under certain conditions, and then teaches the brain to recognize that misinformation so that in the real world, they're inoculated against it. Now today, there's some wonderful inoculation researchers, and I have to name them because they are foundational to what it is that I'm doing. I have a bunch of sources at the end. Um, John Cook, uh, Stephen Lewandowski, uh, Sander van der Linden, who has a wonderful new book out called Foolproof that I recommend to literally everyone, um, Josh Compton, um, John Rosenbeek. So there's wonderful research going on in um, inoculation. So what I've done is applied what these wonderful researchers are finding, and to their credit, they're applying it as well, but to classroom activities. And so I'm going to tell you about how I do that. But um, so and John Cook is one of the researchers, and he's a good friend of mine. Um, he came out for a conference, and we decided to write a paper, because I was telling him like, this inoculation theory is great, and I'm already doing various activities, but I don't actually understand what kinds of inoculation they are and how they work. So we sorted through it, and we wrote a paper, and this is from uh, the paper. So if we, um, this is, again, my brain wanting to organize everything. The method of inoculation. So fact-based means I explain factually why a claim is wrong. Source-based, this one's less studied, but this one is, the source is not credible. Technique-based, I'm going to talk more about, but this is learning the techniques used to mislead. Technique-based outperforms, um, at least fact-based, under most circumstances, because it's broadly generalizable, in that if I teach you a technique used to mislead in one area, and that technique is used someplace else, then you can recognize it. And importantly, it does this without necessarily having to understand all the science behind the particular topic. More on that in a second. OK, the delivery mechanism. Passive is explaining, right? It's a one-way passive flow of information. Active is when the students generate the misinformation themselves. We're going to talk about technique and active based. And actually, in this paper, we proposed a new type of inoculation called experiential, which is where students experience being misled to be inoculated against misinformation. I'll give you an example of that in a second. There's also pre-bunking and debunking, which is pretty hard. I mean, a lot of people have been exposed to a variety of types of misinformation. So whether if, you're, if I'm trying to inoculate against misinformation, but you've already heard it, um, that would be a debunking. But you could do it beforehand. And I always like this one. Humor makes the medicine go down. So I'm going to give you examples of inoculation activities. James Randi used to do this. Uh, the original experiment was Bertram Poor in the 50s, where um, with his psychology class. Here, I, actually, I'm going to walk you through what I do with my students. You're my students. Literally day one. <sighs> Here's the syllabus. Okay. Um, next time we're going to start. But actually, um, I have a friend who is a, a psychic. She's actually really famous. Um, but I don't want to tell you who she is, because I, I don't want to um, um, temper how you um, view this project. So just trust me for now. She's willing to give you a free personality assessment. Um, normally, it costs a lot of money. But she knows that I teach this class. And this class is about being skeptical. 
So what we're going to do, if you want to, you don't have to, but if you want to participate in this, and next time I'll give you your personality assessment. And I ask them leading questions, like, um, if your house was on fire and you could take anything, what would it be? Or if you could have one superpower, what would it be? If you get paid to do anything for a living, what would it be? So I'm, I'm priming them to think that they're being read deeply. Okay, so hopefully I'll have them for you next time. Next class, you know what, I have the results back. Do you wanna see them? Right, so I pass out the envelopes and you know what, um, we're trying to test how effective she is. So please do not let on how accurate you think this reading is. So read it silently. When you're done, we're gonna vote anonymously on a scale of one to five how accurate she is. Now I've been doing this for five, six, seven years. My students on a scale of one to five rate her about a 4.3 to 4.5 out of five, um, which is consistent with what Bertram Porter found. But it's full of this, right? These are horror statements, or Barnum statements, in that, um, like if you've ever had an astrological reading or you know, tarot reading, it's full of, of this. Um, statements that we think uniquely apply to us, but actually are applicable to everybody. So they read this. Okay, read it. Now if you're comfortable, get with another student in class and explain, like, why do you think she was accurate or not accurate? What parts of the reading were accurate? Sometimes it takes them 10 minutes to discover they all got the same one, right? Yes, I lied to you on day one, right? Um, I'd like to tell you I'm not gonna do that again, but I can't, right? Because I want you to be on your toes. This is a class about skepticism, right? So I want you to be skeptical. Don't just trust me. Um, and humor, the humor behind this, um, I try to be self-deprecating. Everybody is misled, right? We're all in this together. Why were you misled, right? So this allows me the opportunity to explain confirmation bias and priming and appealing to authority and Barnum statements, all of that. The students being misled, though, the experience of being misled inoculates them against this technique in the future. So that's experiential inoculation. But I do a lot of active technique based. So this is the rest of what I'm gonna talk about. If you wanna not be misled by someone who bends spoons, learn to bend spoons, right? Imagine a child seeing a magic trick for the first time. So it could look like magic, right? So you could explain to the child what the magician did or you could teach the child magic tricks, right? Learning the magic tricks is like looking behind the curtain. You get to see it. And you get to then, in the real world, be inoculated against those techniques. So, I'm gonna give you some examples. Um, and I'm gonna start broadly with gamified inoculation because there's some wonderful games. I'm gonna talk about a few of them a bit, a bit more. Um, this is at the recent Nobel Prize Summit, and it's um, Cranky Uncle and get bad news. So this is John Cook's game, which I'm gonna talk more about in a second. And this is Sander Vanderlinden and uh, Josh Rosenbeek. Um, sorry, John Rosenbeek. Um, and I'm gonna talk about those two a bit more. Um, actually, Cranky Uncle originally was designed as a uh, climate change inoculation game. But there's a new version funded by UNICEF on vaccines. And it's being um, doled out in, um, it's rolling out, sorry, in uh, parts of Africa and uh, Asia. So there's a lot of interesting uh, work behind this. And um, van der Linden's team has another game called Go Viral, and it's a pandemic uh, misinformation game. And that one is um, funded in part by UNICEF. So there's um, a lot of interesting games. I'm gonna talk about these two. First with bad news. Um, in bad news, your job is to build a fake news empire. And to do that, you have to earn these badges. So to earn those badges, you have to troll, but you have to maintain some level of credibility. So in the process, you learn what kinds of things builds you followers, what kinds of things loses you followers, 
right? And so in the process, like, you know what? Um, conspiracy, right? I can now see conspiracy theories in real news, real fake news. Uh, so this is a wonderful game. Um, Cranky Uncle, um, I spend a lot of time on. Crank, yeah, look, we all know who Cranky Uncle is, right? Like, I don't need to explain this character to you. We all like inherently get it. Um, it's a guy at Thanksgiving you don't want to talk to because you know he's a climate change denier. So this game uses uh, parallel argumentation. So it's cold, global warming doesn't exist. It's dark, the sun doesn't exist. So it's a parallel argument. The techniques of science denial, this, sorry, this game focuses on teaching the techniques of science denial, which are summarized by the acronym FLIC. So fake experts, logical fallacies, impossible expectations, cherry picking, and conspiratorial thinking. So Cranky does this kind of stuff, right? This is an anecdotal argument, um, which is a logical fallacy. So this, though, gets students to see why this is not a good argument without having to go into all the details about climate change. Look, the science behind climate change is complicated. If I have to spend all of my time talking about the science of climate change, you might still fall for this because you don't see why this is a bad argument. This way, you can see it. So, oh, I had a student. So I co-authored a paper um, with, with John um, on this, um, where I'm gonna show you the assignment that I, I have next. Um, but he, my students did a, um, surveys at the end on what you thought of the game. And one of my students said that it teaches you how to smart, outsmart your boomer uncle. Um, and they loved it. They were laughing, they were playing, and that, that's the point. So, I teach a class designed to teach critical thinking. And at the end of the semester, one semester, I was getting emails from students about why they shouldn't fail the class. So, and they would say, my dog died, um, or um, all my other teachers passed me. This is the only class I've ever failed. Um, and I kept thinking, they obviously didn't learn what I was trying to teach them. So I turned it into an assignment. I call it, please don't fail me. After my students play Cranky Uncle, I have them pretend it's the end of the semester and they're failing because they didn't do the work, right? They deserve to fail in this assignment. Write me an email arguing for why you should pass the class using logical fallacies from class. This is actually a student email, and it was published in the paper. All right. What fallacy is this? It's an appeal to emotion. Um, this one, oh. <laughs> people are gonna die if you don't feel me, right? That's a great slippery slope. Um, there's literally homeless people. Why do you care about my grades so much? Right, so that's a great red herring. Um, this is a nice appeal to authority. Um, students love to attack my character, and then they'll apologize at the end, like I really wouldn't ever say that to a professor. Um, after they write these emails, they submit them to a discussion forum where other students, in the email, I should say, in the comments, they have to tell me what logical fallacies they used and how. Then they have to read other students' emails and find the fallacies in those other arguments and discuss them, right? So it's a wonderful activity. Uh, so I've published this with John, and um, the assignment uh, got picked up recently by, um, uh, I'm gonna quote some students from John Schwartz's class here. He's a, um, a journalist, former New York Times journalist who focused on climate change, who now teaches a, a course on journalism at UT Austin. And he got emails like, you are short, and everybody knows that's the most nefarious demographic. Napoleon, hello. Besides, John, can I call you that? You're so old, your birthday candles cost more than your cake. How can you really expect to keep up with modern teaching practices when you were present for the dark ages? You can't fool me, John. I know this is all a liberal conspiracy to suck more money out of the little guy. The more we fail, the more classes we have to take. It's no coincidence every one of my professors is trying to fail me. They're all in it together. Trust me, I'm an independent researcher. I know all about CollegeGate. 
right? So John contacted me after this, and he said, oh God, this makes me so happy. Um, over the rest of the semester, students were reading articles um, for class, and he didn't even ask them to, but they were finding logical fallacies in the different uh, um, articles, and he said they were laughing so hard when they were reading each other's letters. They were laughing with each other and on and on. And he says, um, what did I just do? Oh, sorry. Um, he said that, um, that, wait, hold on. Kenny, I can't use your computer. Okay. Um, it says, it was wonderfully effective. And in two years of teaching, this was the moment I finally felt like I might be getting this right. The students were engaged, they were learning how to spot these fallacies. Okay, so please don't fail me. I teach them how to be a psychic. I teach them how to cold read, basically. I teach them about Barnum statements, about making observations, making stereotypes. When you get something right, lean in. When you get something wrong, find an excuse. When somebody says something to you, they're going to forget it, so lean into that later. Um, they want to believe you, so say the kinds of things they want to hear. They want to hear about love and money and happiness and their jobs, right? They don't want to hear that the person they're trying to contact was a horrible person, right? You have to tell them what they want to hear. So I teach them how to do this, and I've had students say, so after they do this, I show them actual psychics like some of the more famous TV ones, again, not naming names, and they just can't believe people fall for it. They're like, once I can see this, I can't unsee it, right? I'm getting a J name, right? John, James, Jerry, father, grandfather, father figure, right? It's all really common. You know this conspiracy theory, right? Okay, so for those of you who may not know, um, this is a satirical conspiracy theory um, of bird truthers. Basically, birds aren't real. The government killed all the birds in the 60s and replaced them with drones that are spying on us. You know how like birds poop on your car? They're tracking you. You know how they sit on power lines? They're charging up, right? <laughs> There's always a way to make this work. And if you hear the people behind this talk, uh, so what they did um, was uh, started this like satirical, like let's just make fun of this, and people join in. And the more they join in, the more they realize how conspiracy theories work. So conspiratorial thinking is a foundation of science denial, of pseudoscience. When all else fails, the only way to make all of that work is that all the world scientists are conspiring. So to teach them how conspiracy theories work, I don't start with one of those triggering conspiracy theories, I do this. This is funny, nobody's offended. Okay, your job is to make a conspiracy theory. You need to tell me who did what and why. Right? Was it the government? Was it industry? Was it the world science? Who, who's doing something? Um, why are they doing it? Is it power, money, um, and how? You then need to make a compelling narrative for that um, uh, storyline, right? Um, you need to be able to convince somebody. And then you need to go online and find evidence to support your conspiracy theory. Now, conspiracy theories are pattern detection and giving agency th to things that aren't even there. Um, it's an exercise in motivated reasoning, confirmation bias. So, students, they'll start looking for evidence and somebody will eventually raise their hand and go, Professor, do we need to use reliable sources? <laughs> what conspiracy theorist uses reliable sources, right? Go to a YouTube, go to a subreddit, I don't care. You just need to be able to convince somebody. So then what I have them do is get with another group, and their job is to convince the other group of the truth of their narrative. And the other group's job is to disprove the conspiracy. So here's the thing about conspiracy theories. They're immune to evidence, right? All roads lead back to the conspiracy. Evidence that's missing was covered up, right? Evidence that doesn't fit was planted, right? False flags, what, whatever it is that you need to do to make this conspiracy 
withstand the, uh, the attempts to disprove it. They have a blast doing it, right? Um, they, they're trying to find arguments, and they're arguing back and forth about the stupidest things, and, and that's absolutely wonderful, because then they can see, when somebody's appealing to a conspiracy theory, broadly saying they are doing this, and here's my terrible source of information, and the reason that you're wrong is because you know that's just what the media wants you to believe, right? that's easy. And I teach them how to make pseudoscience ads. <clears throat> so I actually wrote an article for Skeptical Inquirer on um, how to sell pseudoscience. Um, this is not from, this is a brand new um, graphic that I made from my students and online. Um, I teach my students the characteristics of pseudoscience first. And then I give them these tongue-in-cheek how to sell it. Right? So you want to get their foot in the door some way. Right? You want to... Um, Money back guaranteed, free trial, right? No risk trial. And if you can build a community around that, even better. Meaning, if you can get them to publicly commit to the product, like put out on social media that they're buying this product or they're using it or they think it's great, once people do that publicly, they're less likely to change their mind. Um, make vague claims, things that can't be proven wrong. Um, you know, like adjusts energy imbalance or supports immune health, right? You can't prove those wrong. They're too vague. Easy solutions. It's a miracle. Super easy. This is the solution you've been looking for. All you have to do is, right? Um, be confident. It's proven to work. If scientists are always wishy-washy, right? They're, they say, well, if you do this and maybe under these conditions, but it has a failure rate, blah, 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 and don't do any of that. Just be confident. Technobabble is personally my favorite. It's a word salad, right? It's either scientific words used out of context or just meaningless words. Um, can you read that? Yeah. So it detoxifies enzymes that cause bioenergetic imbalances at the cellular level. Uh, anecdotes. Anecdotes are the lifeblood of pseudoscience. They are cheap, they're easy, and people are convinced by stories. You could spend all your time and money doing all kinds of scientific studies and then show people your error bars and the significance and the, give them a story. Key logical fallacies. Basically, it's all natural and been used for centuries. And millions of people, and this person with a doctorate says, so this manufacturer expertise um, I actually give my students lab coats if they want to take pictures of themselves. And I mean, everybody looks more official in a lab coat. Um, you can even go a step further and like make sciencey sounding organizations that aren't real. Make it up; people won't look. Um, when all else fails, someone's going to criticize you. Figure out a way to deflect it, which means big pharma, mainstream media—they are all against me. But I'm here to tell you the truth. Right? I'm the hero fighting against all of them. This is the graphic that I use um, in class to show students, and it's the one that was published uh, in Skeptical Inquirer. How many do you see? Oh, and I should add one important thing. Um, pseudoscience at its core, what it's actually selling is hope. In any of its permutations, it's selling false hope and a false sense of um, control. So make people feel like they have hope when they buy your product. Okay, what do you think? Appeal to nature. Appeal to tradition. Oh, it's certified. Okay, 100% uh, natural and organic. Uh, customer satisfaction, 100% uh, guaranteed. Foot in the door. I know it works. I tried it. Anecdote. Dr. Magic's miracle cure. The quick fix secret they don't want you to know about. There's your conspiracy. Um, okay. Um, let's do, oh, here. Restores bioenergy frequencies. But it works at the cellular level. It always works at the cellular level, by the way. Millions for centuries. So appeal to the masses, appeal to tradition. Ah, oh. you know I've actually had people. 
I have put this out on social media with the notice that this is how one would sell pseudoscience. And I have had people message me to buy it. <laughs> it doesn't sell anything, right? There's no product there, which shows how much we need to be careful with this um, and teach people these techniques. So I have students do this. These are real student ads, by the way. Oh, um, tested and proven by the American Academy of Exercise. I, I th honestly think they made that up. Um, quick, Jim, there's your um, super easy solution. It has to be natural and GMO free. We have an anecdote. We have an appeal to Dr. Muscle. <laughs> okay, so um, I do this with my students. Um, you know Bertha Vasquez? Um, I can't say enough good things about Bertha. Bertha teaches middle school, at least until tomorrow, um, and her students have done these. So this is from middle school students. Optimizing cellular detoxification in your lungs. All right, it's a miracle. Here's a testimonial. Right, really nice ad. Also, importantly, she said her students were having a great time. Now, before I show you the next one, I just need it to be out there that I teach college students. And one of the most popular forms of supplements <laughs> you know, honestly, this gets funnier the more you read it. And I'm not going to read any of this aloud just so none of the clips are used against me, but you can all see it. <laughs> okay, right. Brilliant. Now, her students apparently, her middle school boy students, asked her if they could do this kind of product. She told them no. So they did this. Okay, that before and after picture is just brilliant. <laughs> um, okay, detoxifies bone marrow at the cellular level, right? Um, we've got plant-based, of course it is cruelty-free. Now, interestingly, I, I didn't notice this, um, and I'm not gonna put anybody on the spot here and see who notices this, but apparently, that's a porn star <laughs> who puts himself in different jobs. Um, so her middle school students are very aware of this kind of stuff, and they try to pull one over on her. She also let them do video, which I've never done. So here's an example. Are you sick and tired of spending time and money on products that don't work? Well, we have the product for you, Skinnovate. Skinnovate gives you a tanner appearance. Tightens complexion, clears dark spots, gets rid of face fat, and acne. I'm dermatologist Elena Iglesias, and I approve this method. Skinnovate it cures skin cancer, is cruelty free, vegan, and it has no side effects. Why are your skin so clear? What do you use? Oh, I use some Skinnovate. Skinnovate detoxifies skin from. Microbiotics and carbohydrates using enzymes. Hi, I'm Mireya nice Soleil. And before using Skinnovate, I looked like this. But now I look like this. Thank you, thank you, Skinnovate, for changing my life. Honestly, they knocked it out of the ballpark. She must be a very wonderful educator. Um, so, and the reports that I've gotten from her, um, importantly, were that the students were, this last time they were doing this, one of them asked her, why is this stuff legal? So actually, she emailed me and Nick Little to figure out, but it's such a brilliant question, right? It was getting them to think about how people can get away with this. We're gonna be working for him one day. So back to, um, I always give my students a debrief at the end of every inoculation activity. Remember at the beginning of the semester when I fooled you and it didn't feel very good People don't like to be fooled, right? I'm teaching you this so that you don't get fooled. And what I need you to do 
is make sure that others don't get fooled too, right? Be, um, um, with great power comes great responsibility, right? You've learned this. So make sure that you are um, using your powers for good. So um, what I then try to do with educators is, um, these are some of the examples, but honestly, uh, there's as many as there are different types of misinformation. So if you want to make um, an inoculation activity, what you need to do is figure out what kind of misinformation you're after. And then look at the techniques used to create that misinformation. And that's where you want to focus. Add in some humor, um, make it non-triggering, and you've got yourself a technique-based active inoculation activity. You could create ghost photos. You could create propaganda. You could make deep fakes. Um, you could pretend to be a science denier. You could make a fad diet. You could be a social media troll. Whatever it is, we can teach them the techniques so that they don't get fooled by it in the real world, right? Because that's the goal. So um, most of these assignments can be found on my website. Um, this is my website. I just want to give a giant thank you. I, wanna, I want questions, but give a giant thank you to CFI for being so wonderful and supportive of um, me and this work. I can't even tell you how wonderful you all are, so I very much appreciate it. Um, and if anybody wants sources, I know it's kind of small. Um, um, and I can share this with anybody if you're interested. Okay, so does anybody have any questions? Oh, yeah, you do it. Testing, oh, there I am, hey. All right, round of applause. Wasn't that great? That's right. All right, if any, anyone has any questions, uh, put your hand up. I will come running to you and let you use the microphone so everyone can hear the question. Anyone? 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 Yeah? Okay. <laughs> this is how I run. <laughs> Um, so uh, thank you for your uh, excellent presentation. So I, I teach a skepticism course at SUNY Geneseo. And I, there's some, I'm very blown away by all of this stuff. Um, the thing I want to ask though is, isn't there a danger in creating the satire? Like the birds aren't real guy created that as a joke, but he, that he's been kicked out of conferences on the very thing he made up. Uh, there's kind of a danger in this. Yeah, and actually um, there's some really interesting examples of, I, I, one of the reasons that we fall from misinformation, one of the biggest ones, is because it confirms our biases, and satire tends to walk that line. And so you can easily be fooled by satire if that's the kind of thinking that you tend to be prone towards, even though you don't see it's kind of making fun of that. I mean, the answer is yes. Um, however, I'm not sure what the alternative is. Because what I'm trying to do is teach students not to fall for things, um, and my hope would be that we would inoculate enough people that we would get like a type of herd immunity where there would be protection against these kinds of things. And so, um, yeah, I think as an educator, this is my bias, but the, um, the answer is more education. Um, it's very cliche, apologize for that. But <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, you don't get to ask questions. <laughs> So is there any concept of who this comes best from? Uh, if you're, I mean, I, I can say the, but the, the breaking of ideas, of, of fake ideas in other people, is it, you know, sort of better coming from friends, from family members, from professional uh, educators, from who? Yeah, so are you talking about like, can you use these techniques against your friends? Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, you get, uh, look, um, these are, some of them are games. They're literally online games. Um, so yeah, you can play them, you can play them with your friends, you can spread them. Um, and if you do these activities with your friends, I, just know that you're all in on it and have fun with it, right? Um, my focus tends to be, I do write these articles for the general public, and the actual article a lot of these comes from is inoculating yourself against misinformation. Um, 
But I think that if we, for me personally, every educator you get, you get all of their students. And so my, my goal right now, at least, is reaching as many educators as we can. But yeah, play this game with your friends. I have a quick question uh, from online. Uh, this is coming from Rob Palmer. What was the reaction of your superiors at your school when you changed the curriculum? Oh, that is an excellent question. Thanks, yeah, Rob. Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, <laughs> Because they, I'm not the only person to have a class like this, right? There are other wonderful educators doing things like this. Um, they have faced a lot of pushback, right? There's um, sort of the, it seems really ironic that scientists who are supposedly um, evidence, follow evidence where it leads, um, don't really see the evidence that what they're doing isn't really effective and aren't necessarily open um, to change, and in particular, changing curriculum is difficult. I was incredibly lucky. Um, I went to my department, uh, the biology department in their science division, uh, and I said, I, what courses do we teach for non-majors, um, and why do we teach them? So um, why do we teach science literacy, or sorry, science classes to non-majors? Well, science literacy, right? We want our students to be good consumers of information. Yes, do our courses do that, right? And we had, really long in-depth meetings about the different courses and um, analyzing their objectives and trying to figure out if they met that goal. And I made the case that Intro Bio wasn't doing it and they let me cancel that class. And I replaced it with a course designed to teach these skills. Um, I call it Science for Life. Um, but they were very supportive. Uh, and um, again, I know that that's not everybody's experience. Hi, so that was really terrific. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering if you're familiar with the research of Dr. Ray Hall, because he has looked at whether critical teaching someone just basic critical thinking skills is enough to al allow them to utilize that new muscle in areas of pseudoscience or, or paranormal that they maybe believe in or even religion that they believe in, but you know, are very resistant from applying critical thinking skills to those ideas. So is there empirical evidence that this system of inocul inoculation actually works? Yeah, um, so there's a, a couple of good things in there. Um, yeah, I'm familiar with Ray Hall, um, and um, he does a great job using pseudoscience in the classroom for all the same reasons that, that I mentioned. Um, so um, when I teach, um, I think my approach is slightly different um, in that, um, see, let me back up one step further. Critical thinking is actually one of those interesting terms that um, a lot of educators assume they're doing. I know I did. Look, I, this is coming from a place of I can look back at myself and go, I thought I was. I really did. Um, but I don't think I was. But if you ask a bunch of educators even just define critical thinking, Right? You're going to get all kinds of different answers, and they're probably going to be pretty vague. Um, at my college, anybody that teaches any science class is, by definition, a critical thinking class. That is not true. And so what I found is that critical thinking has to be the curriculum. Right? It can't be a part of the curriculum. It can't be a unit that you include. It has to go through the entire thing, in which case using things like pseudoscience and various forms of misinformation in through there. The other thing that I do um, is that um, I spend the first half of the semester, okay, I'm going to say this, and I know how it sounds, so please stick with me. Um, it's a science class, but I don't technically get to science until after the midterm. I spend the very first section on, actually I start with witches, right? The witch trials. They really believed that, right? To the extent that they were murdering people. What was their evidence? Well, it usually came from being accused or confessing. And why'd you confess? They tortured you. So I talk my students through that and go, okay, was their evidence good? Like, why did they believe that? And of course, they, this is again a non-triggering thing. They can step back and look at this without feeling personally threatened. But the goal, of course, is to get students to internalize that, to start thinking about why they believe things. And then I go into skepticism. I introduce my toolkit, so technically that is science. And then um, I do the limits of perception and memory. I use ghosts and UFOs, but 
one of the biggest reasons we think we believe in something. I know ghosts are real. I saw one. I know homeopathy works. I tried it. Right? We think our personal experiences are incontrovertible. But as Richard Feynman said, you were the easiest person to fool. People don't know that. Right? And it's a hard lesson. So I do that. And then I go into metacognition. And we start talking about um, rhetorical techniques, logical fallacies, cognitive biases, the kinds of ways that our thinking goes astray. Right? All this is basic metacognition and critical thinking. And then I get into information literacy. And I don't do information literacy until I did that because we fall for misinformation because it doesn't confirm our bias because it confirms our bias. Students need to know their own thinking, how they approach information. It's going to impact the information they choose, how they interpret it. Then I go into science. And interestingly, um, so I, I've been teaching another class that's the stereotypical way, right? Where it starts with process of science and then goes into all the other things. I find that very abrupt at this point. I spend the first half of the semester laying the case for why we need science. If we don't talk about why we need the process of science to begin with, then why is students to be able to understand what makes the scientific process any different? Actually, it makes the logic of the process of science fall in place for them much easier than if I had just started with it. And then we get to go into um, science denial and pseudoscience and so on. I guess my point is, um, this is a long drawn out process. Right? I've set up my website so that hopefully people go through it in the same linear fashion, but I know people come at me from different places. Um, and that's a really hard thing. I call my students captive. I just keep talking, I'm sorry. Um, I saw my students captive for four months. They want a grade, right? So for four months, they have to stick with me through this whole process where I break down their thinking and teach them these skills along the way. Um, and I find that process to be really effective. And I do have pre-post testing um, at my college and, and another um, that has been using the same curriculum that show the before and after actually shows greater improvement in science literacy than a year in majors course. And while I'm on that subject, I do think we can make a pretty strong case for teaching this kind of stuff in science majors too. Right? Science majors don't learn this stuff. And I know that because I was one. Right? So we could do more science literacy in our science classes as well. But my passion is, is not majors, so I digress. Did I answer your question? Okay, great. <laughs> All right, we have a question from online from John Cook. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, the, with the please don't fail me assignment, how do professors handle getting savaged by their students? I love it. Actually, I love it when students attack my character. And I know John Schwartz did too. I mean, it's all in good fun. And seriously, students do apologize. Um, John Cook is the creator of Cranky Uncle. Um, and John, you're a bit of a cranky uncle. So I know that when students are making fun of you, you would totally appreciate that as well. Um, yeah, I mean, I suppose it takes a certain disposition, but you can't take yourself too seriously. Um, yeah. Thanks, John. Another question? Any questions? Hands up. Yep. Oh, got one up front. Thanks again for, can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> for um, today's presentation, it was wonderful. I would like to follow up on the Geneseo gentleman's question about um, the resources you have students create. So the ones you shared with us today are all uh, innocuous, right? Like they, yeah. they, they wouldn't cause damage, but are there any that you wouldn't you wouldn't have students um, create for fear of them, you know, posting them on social media and then having posts a lot where people will start to believe them? Yeah, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so, look, I tell my students this does not go out, um, but students can do what they will, um, and I purposefully do the the non-triggering stuff that most people wouldn't fall for for. For that reason and for the fact that um, it's, it's easier to teach that lesson without getting into the really heavy stuff. Um, but I also know that students scrolling through social media see stuff exactly like it. Um, and I'm hoping that the lesson that they're learning um, helps them see that and that does more good than 
um, something else. Now, I also know, because um, I've, I've given this various forms of presentations to educators, and some of them have done these with like um, middle school students and high school students, and actually I think this stuff is perfect for middle school and high school. Some of the educators have actually encouraged their students to put them out on social media, um, and I would really advise against that. Um, you know, the purpose of this is for you not to be fooled. Um, please feel free to use this in a non-public way to help other people understand why you shouldn't be fooled. But no one likes to be fooled, so don't be that person. And I'm, I'm not sure, honestly, um, if there's a better way to handle that, but I got a question from online from George. Do parents ever push back on the inoculating of the kids? Do you know what? I teach college students. I can't talk to parents. <laughs> it's one of the reasons I like teaching college students. Um, I have a cat, to be fair. I don't have kids. Um, um, but yeah, I'm not even allowed to tell a um, parent that their kid is in my class because of privacy reasons. They're adults. So no. Yeah. Question. Here we go. Well, back in the Middle Ages when I was in the classroom, I would go to a talk or a conference and I'd hear somebody like you and I'd come back all enthused and say, whoa, I want to do that. Now, in, in maybe for a day or two it would last because you're just overwhelmed with the curriculum and you've got to get through all this stuff. Um, so my first question is, do you see this trickling down to secondary education? And the other thing is with AI today, are you, doing anything to incorporate what's going on with AI, AI and how we can be so misled with that? Yeah, so okay, a couple of good questions. Um, actually, I just lost your first one. Can you remind the me again? Trickle the trickle down, okay. Um, yeah, so um, I often joke that my students don't have to know anything at the end of the semester <laughs> because it's not a prerequisite for something else in that I have a lot of freedom, and I have academic freedom, right? So I can teach what I want in my class, and, and that is an absolute blessing. Um, I know the high school curriculum is pretty prescribed, especially in certain subjects. Um, honestly though, I, with as much as I love teaching my students, by the time they get to me, it's almost too late. Um, I don't wanna say it's ever too late, right? But um, you know, middle school is honestly perfect for this. And my understanding is that, um, there's a lot more flexibility in the middle school curriculum. They still have that youthful energy. They're very curious. Um, and um, you know, teachers are looking for activities, fun and engaging activities to do with their students. Um, I really think that um, especially focusing on middle school educators um, is, is a great way to go with this. The other thing with AI, um, so I've had my students um, do deep fakes, um, but I have not used ChatGTP and mostly because it didn't really become a thing until after my last semester even started. I mean, it was a thing, but it wasn't really a big thing. Um, I think there's value, I mean, look, it is part of our world now, um, and students are using it. <laughs> um, the question is, um, are they using it well? Um, and I almost think that like in my brain in the future, um, I think chat DP, GTP might be a great place to go for um, you know, starting the conspiracy theory activity or um, uh, illogical arguments for students to analyze. Um, so I think what we need to do as educators, and I say this coming from a place of very little experience with this, but um, I think we as educators need to embrace it because it is here and figure out the best way that we can um, teach students how to use it. Do we have any other questions? Put your hand up. Any, any, no? I do have one more question from online. Uh, what do you know about psychological inoculation? Oh, I'm sorry. What do you, what do we know about why psychological inoculation works? You mentioned how vaccines teach the body to produce antibodies. Does the kind of inoculation you deliver teach the mind how to produce antibodies? Oh, um, I would say that it teaches the mind how to recognize misinformation and not fall for it. I don't recall those things. Um, I mean, antibodies are um, in the biological immune system. They are um, 
something that um, we know how they work. I think this science is kind of, um, I say it in its infancy. Inoculation is, what, 70 years old now? Um, 60? And so, um, so we, we, we know that that works. We're still learning more about how and how long it lasts and what's the best way to do it. Um, but as far as like what actually is going on in the brain, I'm going to say that's probably above my great pay grade. All right, any more questions? Yes? Oh, we do have one more. You're getting a lot of questions. How do you tell the difference between misinformation and belief? For instance, I've done a lot of surveys, and 90% of the people believe in uh, evolution. But a very high proportion of those believers, especially farmers who are dealing with evolution of animals and things like that, don't believe in human evolution. Right? So, I don't know if there's misinformation. I mean, what is, so there's a blockage, right? Somewhere along the line. How do you deal with that? Um, hello. So, um, do I need to start over again? Uh, okay, so um, let, let's start with defining a belief, which is actually really difficult to do, but um, generally speaking, it's something that you accept is true. Um, it doesn't have to be true, you just think it's true. So of course we have false beliefs. I mean, we all have false beliefs. What are they, right? Obviously, if we knew what they were, we wouldn't believe in them. Um, misinformation is outside the body, so information itself is something that you take in and then maybe incorporate into your thinking. And this is why I teach students first about their thought processes, about beliefs, about how they come to beliefs, about um, critically thinking through those beliefs before I move them to information. Because again, that's something else that's coming into uh, their brain and they're trying to figure out, do I accept this as true? And to be able to evaluate if something is true or not, one needs to understand what you bring to it and then also be a good consumer of information. Does that answer your question? Well, that wraps it up. Thank you, everyone. There's going to be time where you can hang out. You can ask more questions, meet everybody, socialize. So please socialize, get to know each other. But round of applause for Melanie. Awesome lecture. <laughs> you did great.